Director Ray, it's obviously important that we respect First Amendment protections, but there is clearly a point at which some violent rhetoric crosses over into threats of violence or leads to actual violence. Could you describe how the FBI looks at this relationship between rhetoric and action and what you are seeing around the country? So I appreciate the question, and this is an issue that I've been talking about for some time. Uh, you know, in our view, there is a right way and a wrong way under the First Amendment to express your views, no matter how passionate or even angry you are. And violence and threats of violence is not the right way. And we don't care what you're upset about or who you're upset with when, from the FBI's perspective, when it turns to violence and threats of violence, that's when we have to draw the line. That's when we get engaged. Uh, and there is an alarming phenomenon that we've seen over the last several years uh, of that kind of passion and heated rhetoric turning into actual violence and threats of violence. We've seen it uh, against public officials of all sorts. We've seen it against law enforcement. The number of officers shot and killed in the line of duty in this country is frankly outrageous and alarming. Uh, and I know that because every time an officer is shot and killed anywhere in this country, since the day I started as FBI director, I personally call the chief or the sheriff to express my condolences uh, and to talk to them about the, the victim's family. Uh, and the number of those shootings that are ambush related, meaning somebody is targeting law enforcement because they're law enforcement, is particularly alarming. I have made around 400 of those phone calls. It's almost every five days that a law enforcement officer is killed in the line of duty. And that is an example of the kind of ways in which uh, passions and heated rhetoric can bubble over into violence. Thank you. Members of Congress, their families, and their staffs have witnessed an alarming rise in threats against them. I appreciate the work your agency has done to investigate and address these threats, but I'm concerned that we do not seem to be stemming the tide. What is the FBI doing to ensure that members of Congress, their families, and their staffs are safe? So we have a, a very close relationship uh, with the Capitol Police, um, and we have members of the Capitol Police, for example, who are on some of our task forces. We share intelligence information uh, about things that we're seeing, trends that we're seeing with Capitol Police uh, and others in law enforcement. Obviously, if we have specific information, about uh, an effort to target a member of Congress, then we're getting with Capitol Police in a much more specific way. Uh, but those are some of the things that we're doing. Thank you. Now, Director, your office is leading the investigation into the attempted assassination of Donald Trump. Republicans in Congress, including members of this committee, have repeatedly called for defunding the FBI. What impact would defunding or even just limiting your funding have on the FBI's ability to conduct this and other investigations? So, uh, <laughs> I understand that there are heated views, opinions about us, just like there are about every institution in today's America, but cutting our funding is incredibly short-sighted, and the people it really hurts are state and local law enforcement and the American people we're all sworn to protect. Thank you. During my remaining time, I want to turn to a different matter. In recent days, Republican members of Congress have attacked presumptive Democratic presidential nominee Kamala Harris as a, quote, DEI, DEI candidate, which presumably is code for women and person of color. It's not a new theme for them. In May, Chairman Jordan wrote to you claiming that because of DEI initiatives, the FBI is no longer hiring, quote, the best and brightest candidates to fill the position of special agent. With, remaining time, with my remaining time, Director Ray, can you please answer the following questions? Is it true that hiring women and people of color means that FBI is no longer hiring the best and the brightest to serve as law enforcement officers? Is there any evidence that women and people of color are less effective in law enforcement roles and what message does it send to prospective applicants when the leaders demean them and make judgments about them based solely on the race or gender? Witness may respond. So any notion that we have lowered our standards, our hiring standards, is just not accurate. Uh, in fact, the, our standards are as competitive and selective as ever. We have tens of thousands of people applying, and our selection rate is about 3.1 percent, which is more selective than just about any university in the country. Uh, and most of our applicants, I think something like 50% of them are coming from military or law enforcement backgrounds. About 50% of them also have advanced degrees. Uh, the average age is around 31, which 
means they're bringing a wealth of personal and professional experience when they arrive. And to suggest that those people, because of efforts related to diversity or anything like that, uh, are less qualified, frankly, is not at all consistent with what I see, having visited all of our field offices and seen these young people in action, and I think is an insult to those hardworking men and women who've signed up to dedicate their lives for this country. Thank you, Director. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, Director, uh, let me go back to where Mr. Bishop was. Tell me about the drone. You, you, you act like you wanted to fill us in on that. Fill us in. So uh, we have recovered a drone uh, that the shooter uh, appears to have used. Uh, it's being exploited and analyzed by the FBI lab. Uh, the drone was recovered uh, in his vehicle. So at the time of the shooting, the drone was in his vehicle uh, with the controller. Uh, in addition, our investigation has uncovered do you know what time of day he flew it, and if he flew it on the sort of day of the shot? Yeah. Oh, I'm so, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, Go ahead. So in addition, it appears that around 3.50 uh, p.m., 4 o'clock in that window, uh, on the day of the shooting, uh, that the shooter was flying the drone around uh, the area uh, Two hours about 11 minutes. I want to be clear, but when I say the area, not over the, the stage and that part of the area itself, but I would say about 200 yards, give or take, away okay. from that. We, we think, but we do not know, so again, this is one of these things that's qualified because of our ongoing review, that he was live streaming, you know, viewing the footage from that again, about 11 minutes in around the 3.50, 4 o'clock p.m. range. Two hours before, he's flying a drone in the, in the vicinity of, of the yeah, route. About 200 yards away, yes. 200 yards, okay, that's, that's important information. What, what about the bombs that we've heard about in, in, the, in the shooter's car? <coughs> So again, uh, the FBI lab is exploiting those uh, explosive devices. Yep. There were, uh, we've recovered three devices, two uh, in his vehicle and one back in his residence. Um, are, these, are these what you would call, your experts would call sophisticated operations or this, when we, I mean... I think... I mean, I don't know. I, 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 that's what I've been told by yeah. people who have some understanding of this area. Yeah, I, I, I think it's... Um, We've seen more sophisticated and less. I would say these are relatively, again, keyword, relatively crude devices themselves, but they did have um, the ability to be detonated remotely. And so to that point, uh, in addition to the two uh, devices that we recovered out of his vehicle, um, there were uh, receivers for those two explosive devices okay. with the devices, and then on the shooter himself, uh, when he was killed by law enforcement, uh, he had a transmitter with him. Now, I do want to add one important point here, is at the moment, it looks to us, again, ongoing review, and I right. can't say that right. too many times, at a moment, it looks like, because of the uh, on-off position on the receivers, that, that if he had tried to detonate those devices from the roof, it would not have worked, okay. but that doesn't mean the explosives weren't dangerous. And we're, I'm sure we're going to get into all these subjects uh, a little bit later as well. Uh, tell, us, tell us what you can about the encrypted platforms we've heard about. So um, one of the things that we're drilling into hard with the shooter um, in an effort to try to learn more about his state of mind, his motive, his ideology, his contacts, everything else, is to look at all of his devices, any uh, social media accounts right, he had, right. et cetera. And uh, one of the things we've learned in finally getting into his phone, which was also a significant technical challenge from an encryption perspective, but in addition, once we got on the phone, it turned out he was using some encrypted messaging application.